to More Living with Jim Brogan, your source of information for living the best years of your life, your way. For more than a decade, host Jim Brogan and his expert guests have come together each week to share important news and advice that can impact the lives and well-being of those who are retired and those nearing retirement. Learn about issues like health and fitness, financial planning, social security benefits, investment advice, and more. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Good morning, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. As you're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI, I hope you had a great great holiday season the new year is upon us i hope you have great plans for 2020 i know that i do i feel like 2020 is going to be the best year yet so it is upon us and so is a huge piece of retirement legislation the secure act which has now been signed into law and it stands for you know how congress is they always want to set up some sort of an acronym it stands for, so it's SECURE, stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Uh, it makes many changes from the age at which re- required minimum distributions are due to how long heirs have to deplete an inherited IRA. And while in, other, in, in many cases it is giving to us, the taxpayers, in other cases it is taking away from us, the taxpayers, and in many ways, uh, with part of this legislation, and there these things are trade-offs, but in many ways, it is a broken promise in terms of how we leave our retirement accounts to our beneficiaries. So the legislation, it also affects businesses. But for now, let's focus on how it's likely to affect you. Retirees have until age, now have until age 72, to start withdrawing from traditional retirement accounts. That's up from 70 and a half. And there will no longer be a maximum age for IRA contributions, which also was previously the year you turned 70 and a half. One change uh, that will affect many estate plans and heirs is that the stretch IRA option was, for the most part, eliminated. There's a couple of exceptions, but otherwise eliminated. Instead of taking RMDs based on their life expectancy, uh, when you inherit an IRA, uh, you must now empty the account over 10 years. And it doesn't matter when and how over the 10 years. It just has to be done over the 10 years. Uh, I've even seen debate uh, with over, is it 10 years to the day of death or 10 years, and you look at the day of death and during the calendar year, so if somebody died on March 1st of 2020, you know, is that March 1st of 2030 or is it December 31st of 2030? Uh, that's been debated, actually. I'm sure we'll get some clarity on that. Uh, that's for any one that has passed away as of January 1st of 2020. It's not for, if you, if you inherited an IRA prior to that, you can still do a stretch IRA. The SECURE Act... Um, isn't the only thing to start planning for in 2020. Medicare Part A and Part B premiums and deductibles will also rise. Uh, Experts don't think the Fed will decrease interest rates. I don't think they will either. And inflation will probably stabilize around 2%. But these are just guesses. No one really knows where the economy is headed in 2020. Um, But We're going to talk about those things today. And, hey, if you're resolved to figure out your financial future in 2020, we're in a new decade. There's a couple of ways you can do that. One, uh, we're happy to schedule you a free consultation in our office. You can uh, call us at 865-862-6800. That's 862-6800. You can visit us online at broganfinancial.com. I've also got my upcoming college class. Uh, My next one is Financial Survival for Retirement. It's January 30th and uh, January, excuse me, January 30th and February 6th uh, at UT Downtown. And then I'll be in uh, Pellissippi State, Blount County in March. You can find our, now for the UT class, financialsurvivalforretirement.com. You can get more information. Get ahead of things and get your financial affairs in order for the coming decade. Now, in today's show, we're going to talk about higher Medicare premiums in 2020, inflation predictions, and how adult children can protect their elderly parents 
against scams. But first, let's talk a little bit more about the SECURE Act. So the new rules, first off, allow part-time workers to participate in 401ks. You know, employees are typically required to work a 1,000 hours in a 12-month period in order to participate in a 401k. Under the new law, they only have to work half of that for three consecutive years. So 500 hours a year uh, for three consecutive years. Um, This isn't mandatory, and it won't be effective until January 1st of 2021. So this is for next year. But that's something to know. For younger workers, there are going to be more flexibility. Now, you're or there is going to be more flexibility. Now, your employer has to offer these things, but they're also in the in the legislation, and I'm not going to get real deep into the business side of it for businesses, but it's going to make it cheaper for small businesses, more affordable for them to be able to offer 401ks. There's going to be more flexible flexibility in how 401ks can even maybe be pulled together. Um, pulled like P-O-O-L-E-D, pulled together. There, so there's just some different things that will allow younger workers more options to actually be able to participate in a 401k. And that is really, really good news because there's no question in my mind the best way to accumulate financial independence and wealth is through retirement accounts because the tax incentives that are given, either up front or, or at retirement, You know, either get a tax deduction up front front on a traditional IRA or you get tax-free withdrawals on a Roth 401k or Roth IRA. Uh, But then even just as significant is the fact that as the accounts are growing, you don't get a 1099 have to pay income taxes on things like interest and dividends and capital gains and capital gains distributions. So it's a great way to accumulate wealth. So the more opportunity we can give folks to contribute to 401ks, uh, the better off, the, the, the more opportunity you're going to have. Now, then there were changes to retirement plan withdrawals. As I said, the required minimum distribution won't be required until age 72. And workers can continue to contribute to a traditional IRA as long as you have earned income past age 70 and a half. So if you're 78 and you're doing some work, you can contribute. Um You know, you can't contribute. There's limits, and you can't contribute more than you make, but you can contribute to an IRA. So that's kind of nice. Parents can also withdraw up to $5,000 penalty-free within a year of a birth or adoption. So just a little bit more access. Uh, That doesn't mean tax-free. It means penalty-free. Now, then they took the stretch IRA option away. This is a significant issue. So when you pass away... Um, Now, when the money goes to a spouse, the spouse can roll that IRA into his or her name, which is almost always how you want to do that. The the biggest exception would be if the spouse is not 59 and a half years old yet, you might would consider actually inheriting that IRA, and the old rules still will apply to you. You don't have to take out the entire account within 10 years, but then once you're, and the reason is because you have pre-59 and a half access without a penalty. But then once you're 59 and a half, you probably then do want to roll it into your name as what's called a spousal continuation. But anyone other than a spouse now has to empty the account out within 10 years. There's exceptions for, you know, if you have a someone with a disability, and if it goes to a minor child, it doesn't have to be emptied out, but once that minor child turns age of majority, so let's, and it depends on the state. So let's say Tennessee. Tennessee, 18 is the age of majority. So once that child turns 18, then by the time that child is 28, the account's got to be emptied. So the 10-year rule starts when the child turns 18 or 21 if they're in that type of a state. But previously, IRA beneficiaries could take distributions over the course of their own lifetimes. In other words, they could stretch those payments. We call that a stretch IRA. Or maybe put another way, you could stretch uh, the tax bill across your lifetime. Now, the IRA must be depleted within 10 years. This could mean an increased tax burden to your kids, and it could mean an end to creditor protection for IRAs held in a trust. So, The IRA distribution planning, now that's a big part of what we do. That is the most overlooked area in estate planning is how your retirement accounts get passed to your children and grandchildren. It's 
absolutely the most overlooked area in estate planning, in my view. And most estate planning attorneys I talk to agree with me on that. Um, And we've done a lot of planning to help clients with that. It's got to be reassessed, especially if you are leaving IRA money, type money for, you know, retirement account money to a trust. Because usually that type of language in a trust says that only the minimum has to be taken. Whatever the law requires is what has to come out of the IRA every year, which in the past has been a minimum distribution across the beneficiary's lifetime. Well, now the minimum for the first nine years is zero because it just the account has to be depleted within 10 years. So with the first nine years, the minimum is zero. Well, then it would go all to that 10th year and then all be taxed. And at a trust tax rate, you get into the 37% tax rate very, very quickly. So I don't want to get too much into the layer of the onion. I've got other things to talk about today, and it does get very complicated. But there are a lot of planning issues that are arising with this new bill. Then there are a lot of opportunities. One, should you wait till age 72 to take money out of your retirement accounts? I mean, there's some tremendous tax planning opportunities. I've talked a lot about that sweet spot of between retirement age and age 72 where you can take advantage. I mean, once you're 72 and you have to start taking money out of your retirement account, your flexibility for tax planning is going to decrease because you have a required distribution of about 4% that you have to take out every year. So if you have a million dollars in your IRA, you've got to take out $40,000 fully taxable. Most, if not all, of it's taxable. So your flexibility with tax planning potentially changes. Well, we've got two extra, one to two years of extra planning here that could really be valuable. Well, you need to get on that. You, you could maybe realize capital gains at a 0% tax rate or, or do some Roth conversion planning in 10 and 12% brackets when once you're 72 and come 2026 when the, when the tax law sunsets and we go back to the rules from three years ago, 2017, you might be 25% tax bracket. So if you can pay 10 or 12 now, you know, it's almost like it's on sale if it's going to be 25 in five years, six years. Now, you have to be able to afford to pay the tax. So there's a lot of planning goes in. And then on the estate and the planning, there's a lot of planning that goes in of how you pass your IRAs. It just, it's got to absolutely be reassessed um, as you move forward. Now, in my class, Financial Survival for Retirement, we actually do a pretty good segment, about an hour's worth, on taking money out of your retirement accounts. What are the rules while you're alive? And what are the rules when you pass away? And we're gonna, that'll be freshly updated for the SECURE Act. So, uh, that next class is January 30th and February the 6th. That's at, uh, University of Tennessee downtown. You can go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com. That's the name of the class. Four is F-O-R. Financialsurvivalforretirement.com. You can download a syllabus. There's a short video and you can click to register. I would love to see you there. If you cannot make that class, if you go to my website at broganfinancial.com, click on classes, you can see all the upcoming classes through the spring. But you, you you need to reassess how you want to handle your retirement accounts. Now, coming up next, we'll discuss higher Medicare premiums in 2020. So don't go away as you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You are listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. During the week, Jim is a financial advisor, an author and speaker with an MBA from the University of Tennessee who specializes in helping people in or near retirement plan for the next phase of their lives. You can reach Brogan Financial during the week at 865-862-6800 or on the web at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. And uh, be careful out there. It's very, very wet. Let's talk about 2020 a little bit. Uh, Let's talk about Medicare and Social Security. Medicare premiums, Part A and Part B premiums, and deductibles. Now, of course, there's not a premium for Part A, but there is a deductible. Part A is your hospitalization. 
Part B is everything else, like, you know, not the drugs, but it's doctors, outpatient, lab work, all that stuff. But premiums and deductibles will rise 7% in 2020. Now, Social Security increase benefits only went up 1.6%. And since 2009, Social Security benefit increases have averaged less than 1.5% per year. Inflation's been around 2 I guess it's been as low as in the in the ones one and a half to two point two, but for most of the years it's been on a, on a typical is right around two percent. But bottom line is your social security benefits going up one point six percent for the average worker that works out to twenty four dollars a month. So twenty four dollar a month increase. The Medicare Part B premiums going up about nine dollars a month. So that offsets, you know. Close to 40%, 35 to 40% of that increase, uh, plus the full $24 is potentially up to 85% of that is tax for income tax. So that reduces that benefit. Uh, so, you know, not a big increase at all. And that's become kind of the norm. And then deductibles for Part A and Part B also went up 7% when you have, a, you know, when you actually have to utilize care. Um, so for about 70% of Medicare beneficiaries, premiums will rise almost 7%. For upper income retirees, uh, the premiums also adjusted. Those of you that get Medicare surcharges, and let me just talk about that a minute. You know, if you're, if you're on Medicare, you know, they look at your income from two years prior to determine how much Medicare premium you have to pay for Part B. And, so for 2020, they're looking at your income in 2018. Well, what if you were working in 2018 and earning a full income, and then in 2020, you're not going to earn as much because you're retired. Maybe you retired last year. Maybe you're retiring this year early in the year. You have a right under the law to have your Medicare premium adjusted based on the amount of income you expect to make in 2020. If you're, you're not, you have what's called a life-changing event. So, you know, stopping working is a life-changing event. Now, if you sold a piece of property in 2018 that made your income be a lot higher, that doesn't, you can't do anything about that. But if it's for retirement, separating service, you have a right to have that adjusted. And so Medicare has a process that you can go through uh, to have your premium reduced. Now, you're, you're signing essentially a sworn affidavit as to what your income you believe will be in 2020. Uh, so you're saying as of the time you sign that, you believe that to be true. Now, if you end up making more income, they'll just come back and adjust your premium. You do need to be completely straightforward. If something comes up, you know, what if you get a consulting job in September that you didn't plan on? Well, that's okay. They'll just adjust it. You just, at the time you sign the affidavit, you know, you didn't expect to have more income. But you have a right to do that. So if you haven't done that, that is something we help our clients with at Brogan Financial, is we help our clients make sure they're not overpaying and being penalized for their Medicare premium where they have a legal right to have it adjusted if they have retired and have a life-changing event. So... um the, the Medicare premium for Part B, the base premium, went up about nine dollars. It went from one thirty five fifty per month to one forty four sixty. So it's eight dollars and no, no, it's nine dollars and ten cents. It's just a little over nine dollars. And then the Part B deductible went up from one hundred eighty five to one hundred ninety eight dollars. Part A deductible for hospitalization is increasing by forty four dollars. Bottom line, seven, almost a 7% increase. And then the Social Security is a 1.6% increase. So for the average, the benefit goes up $24, but part of that potentially is taxed. The government typically deducts your Medicare Part B premium from your Social Security check, and that's what you want to do. Um, now, Medicare Advantage premiums are expected to decline 23% in 2020. Now, what's the reason for the pre-Medicare increases? Medicare blames the increases on rising spending for drugs administered in the doctor's offices, which are covered under Part B. So we're not talking about the drugs you get at the drugstore. We're talking about the drugs that are administered in the office. Oftentimes, these are cancer treatment drugs. 
And so Medicare is blaming a lot of the increase on those drugs. Um, you know, I think the biggest takeaways that I want you to think about with Medicare is, you know, it's important that you roll in, enroll uh, before your 65th birthday, about two or three months before you turn 65. You need to enroll. If you're working, you need to check with your employer plan and see what your employer requires. Uh, but if you're not working, you need to enroll. Otherwise, you'll be penalized for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, typically retirees are going to get some sort of a Medicare supplement or a Medi- Medicare Advantage plan to fill in some of the holes that Medicare does not cover. And, you know, when you're, if you're just a normalized, normal utilizer of healthcare services, when you're 65, you're going to spend five to all in Medicare premiums and your utilization, like your deductibles and co-pays all in. You're going to spend uh, just an average person is going to spend five to six thousand dollars per year on their medical. But that's all in, including their utilization. So you can compare that to what you're currently paying. What you'd have to look at is what type of premium is deducted from your check if you're working. So what is your health care costing you? And then what are well, how much are you utilizing and what are your deductibles and co-pays? What are those all adding up to? So for a lot of people, their health care costs really don't increase much in retirement unless you have a really rich plan at work that pays all the premium. But you need a plan to make sure that your income plan is going to meet all your medical needs. Obviously, that's a critical part of your retirement planning. And then I think there's also a realization that Social Security benefits are probably not going to keep up with inflation. And I think it's overwhelmingly likely they will not keep up with inflation. And so what that means is over time, your ability to fight the ravages of inflation are going to fall more and more on your own life savings and how you set up your income plan to supplement uh, your Social Security from your savings. So it's going to become more disproportionately weighted towards withdrawals from your savings for most retirees as you move along. So you need a good plan for that. You need stability of income in the short term. If we have a market correction or bear market in the next couple of years, how are you going to secure your income where it's not affected by the market? volatility. But then likewise, you have long-term growth because inflation is a very powerful opponent and and you cannot underestimate the power of inflation. So coming up next, I'm going to discuss inflation and the upcoming year. So do stick around. Also, be sure to check us out at our website for our upcoming classes. You can also schedule for a free consultation. Um, Go to broganfinancial.com. That's www.broganfinancial.com. You can also click to get our e-newsletter blast that goes out every year, or excuse me, every week with links to all the content I've produced for that week, the Retirement Minute podcast. My Dollars and Cents podcast, uh, any other kind of resource updates, that newsletter is a great way to stay in tune to information so you can make prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life. So don't go away. When we come back, we'll talk about inflation in 2020. As you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Through his weekly radio show, television news appearances, and adult education classes taught at the University of Tennessee and Pellissippi State Community College. Jim taps into his extensive knowledge and experience to address issues important to living your best retirement. Join Jim every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI and visit him online at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Happy New Year to you as we are uh, getting ready for what I hope for you is a great, great new year and a great decade for that matter. I'm so excited about the 2020s. Well, is it going to be the roaring 20s? You know, I don't know that economically it'll be the roaring 20s or in the markets. Um, You know, it might be. You never know. Uh, I don't think the markets are going to be the roaring 20s, not for the entire decade. But you know what? I think it can be the roaring 20s for you and for me in the way we live. That's what this show's all about is living the best years of your life your way. And uh, with good planning, uh, most people that I meet with, with a good plan, can accomplish and make it the roaring 20s in uh, in your richness of life. Let's talk about inflation in 2020. 
The inflation rate is currently around 2.1%, which is relatively low. Uh, But even low inflation rates can eat away at your retirement savings over the course of decades. And I have some numbers here on that. You know, if you, if you, uh, just to give you an exact example, uh, I think a good assumption for the inflation rate over the next 20 years, 20 to 30 years is 2.5%. That's a little higher than it's been the last 10 years. Um, number one, most economists that I listen to that, that are, that have been good track records over the long haul, say two and a half. Uh, also, if anything, we want to be cautious in our expectations. So if we assume two and a half, if it ends up being two, then we come out ahead. But if we assume two, it ends up being two and a half, you could come up short. So I think two and a half is a pretty good assumption. So even with low inflation, that means let's just use an example. Let's say in, in year one of retirement, you need $80,000 a year of income to live on. So 80000 In 10 years, you're going to need over a hundred. So it's going to go up a little over 20%, 25%. And in 20 years, you're going to need 131000 Now, for those of you that retire at a young age, let's say 60, you could live to 95. Or if you even retired in your late 50s, in 30 years, that 80000 will have to more than double to 167000 So here's kind of another way I'd put that. If you retire with whatever your income need is, 50000 80000 100000 whatever it is, if it doesn't grow, then in 30 years, that, um, that income's cut in half. It'll only be like, you know, if it's 100000 today and it's 100000 in 30 years, that'll be like drawing less than 50000 today. So it'll cut your income in half, more than in half, over the 30-year period. So that's a good way to think about that. Um, so even low inflation rates can eat away. Uh, now, the inflation rate in 2020 is expected to stabilize around 2%. Uh, predictions say that somewhat slower economic growth in 2020 will prevent inflation pressures from picking up. Uh, now, swings in energy costs tend to be responsible for large changes in the, fl- in the inflation rate. Many aren't considering that as a big possibility. However, certainly with what happened this week in Iran, you know, could that upset the apple cart with energy prices? Absolutely. We don't know where how that's going to play out, but it absolutely can. I mean, price oil went up the last two days, so it absolutely could affect prices of energy. Now, the core inflation rate will slightly be higher at about 2.3%. Core inflation does not include food and energy. But in your day-to-day life, food and energy is a big part of that, right? I mean, we pay to get around. We pay for energy. We pay for fuel. And we pay for food, for sure. So really... The core inflation excludes those things, but in reality, in day-to-day life, we've got to be including those. Uh, The inflation rate is higher partially because of a 20% increase in health insurance costs, and that's caused a 5.1% inflation rate in medical services. So medical services are absolutely going up a lot. With inflation close to 2% and a stable economy, the Fed is not likely to cut interest rates for a while. So interest rates are likely to remain quite low. Food prices will probably be higher, about 1.5% to 2% higher, and shelter costs have risen, risen as, as well. But inflation can really pose a problem for retirees. And so I don't want you to underestimate the impact of inflation on your retirement income. It's, I call it the silent killer of retirement. It, it's kind of like cholesterol. You know, it kind of sneaks up on you and you wake up in 10 years and you're like, man, Jim, where'd all my income go? So you need a plan to grow your income. And as I mentioned in the prior segment, over time, because Social Security has been going up lower than the inflation rate, over time, more than likely, you're gonna, the, the, your ability to fight inflation on your income is going to fall more and more to your own savings and how you structure income from your life savings. Okay? So that's uh, a very, very important part of your planning. Now, let's talk about protecting older parents. And, you know, I thought about this over the holidays because, uh, you know, holidays are a notorious time for financial fraud and the elderly are prime targets. And there are ways to protect your aging parents against scams. 
So what do you need to be thinking about? The, the World Health Organization estimates that one in six older adults worldwide is a victim of elder abuse. Elder abuse comes in a lot of forms. It could be financial abuse. It could be emotional. It can be physical. There are a lot of uh, uh, kinds of abuse, though. And financial abuse particularly can come not only from scammers, but from people close to your elderly parent or grandparent or knee or uncle or aunt. You know, a child that's helping take care of your of the elderly loved one or a caregiver. There can be financial abuse. Now, scammers themselves try to capitalize on the generosity of older adults. And older adults may fall for con men asking for personal information over the phone, like their Social Security or Medicare info. And relatives can't always fix the problem quickly after the information has been given away. So a lot of this, I think, is about communication with your parents It's not easy, and sometimes they may not realize they need help or want to accept it. They might not know how to recognize scams, and early forms of dementia can often go undiagnosed and make it hard for people to know when they need help. So I think the biggest thing is open communication, being really dialed into the mental acuity of your parents or aunts and uncles. Um, Also, from a legal perspective, having a financial power of attorney and the medical power of attorney, properly done by an attorney, that helps protect that parent and then gives the control to a loved one. Uh, now, then that pi- that loved one can also abuse that. And so that's, you know, it's just something you have to be really aware of what's going on with the assets and the, fun- and the, the well-being, the physical well-being of an aging parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle. But the estate plan is a great way to be addressing this. Also, what is, you know, what is your access to your parents' information? But I think one of the most critical things is open communication and being in tune to your parents' mental acuity. I cannot tell you how important that is. To just be aware when things seem, are are things seeming just a little bit off? Because once you start noticing that, you've really got to pay attention because um, they could really be subject to financial abuse. Uh, They could also just be just subject to making very poor mistakes or decisions because of their lack of mental acuity. So starting that conversations about financial safety can be very difficult, but it absolutely can help in the long run. So I think as your parents age, putting yourself into that planning as much as your parents will allow it and are comfortable with it, having those conversations before they start to lose some of that mental acuity, and then creating a long-term plan. Also having a plan for long-term care. You know, how's that going to be funded? Is it going to be funded out of assets? Is it going to be self-funded? Or do you need some sort of an insurance program, especially for you folks that are in your 60s or 50s? Uh, there are programs available, asset-based programs that are available for people even in their 70s where the asset that you use is still your money. But if you need it for long-term care, it could turn into two or three times as much money. You put 100000 in, it could grow to three hundred if you need it for long-term care. But it's your money. So there are some great options out there for how to pay for long-term care. I think in today's world, it can be very difficult to know who to trust and how to look out for things we should have, we should avoid. Now, um, yeah, so that'd be the biggest thing is open communication, dialogue, and really being in tune to mental acuity. Okay, we're going to get to our final break. When we come back, economic outlooks for 2020 and how you need to be adjusting your financial plan based on where we are in 2020. So don't go away. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. If you miss any of today's show or want to listen to it again, visit broganfinancial.com where you can access the podcast and other educational materials to help you in your journey through retirement. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome to 2020. I hope 2020 is uh, 
works out to be an absolutely phenomenal year for you. I'm excited about 2020. I'm excited about spending more time with my family, my wife, my two girls, and my friendships. I'm excited about serving all the people we serve at Brogan Financial and continuing to serve more and more people because I feel like we have an opportunity to impact lives for people. Uh, to get their planning in place so they can live the life they've always wanted to in retirement. I just think 2020 and the entire decade can be phenomenal if you get your affairs in order and create a plan. Uh, let's talk about the economy. Um, the, the, the Federal Reserve and, and, and an economic outlook for 2020. The Federal Reserve, in their last meeting of 2019, held interest rates steady and messaged that it could continue to maintain rates where they are through 2020. Uh, Now, Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that 2019 has been far from dull in terms of Fed policy. That's an understatement. Just remember, uh, the consensus seems to be that 2020 will be maybe not like 19, probably not, not as vibrant, probably decent economically with some growth in the markets. But, you know, just five, six months ago, everybody was talking about recession. And the Federal Reserve was all over the board. So they didn't raise interest rates at their last meeting. They planned, their announced plan is to maintain interest rates where they are through 2020. And current projections show interest rates rising by the end of 2021 and again by the end of 2022. However, as you may be aware, these projections just have not been accurate in the past at all. And I actually think the Federal Reserve is way too reactionary to short-term events, uh, personally. So uh, we'll just have to sit tight. But, you know, in 2020, there's a tight labor market. There's a prediction to end 2020 with a 3.5% unemployment rate. We ended 2019 at 3.5%, which is a 50-year low. The Fed projects inflation rising by about 2% by the end of 2020. Uh, It's actually 1.9, and then hitting 2% in 2021 and 2022. Um, Those are just projections. Jerome Powell acknowledged that 2019, as I mentioned, was far from dull. They cut interest rates in July, September, and October this year, where, you know, they had talked about rising, increasing rates a couple of years ago. Um, Jerome Powell is very hopeful. He sees the glass as much more half full than half empty. But you know what? We just don't know. And the one thing I do know is that things are unpredictable. The other thing I know is markets are very volatile. So a couple of things to think about in 2020. One, low interest rates are a real problem for retirees because of investment income on fixed income things like CDs, bonds. Interest rates are really low. And that means one of two things. Either interest rates will stay low, in which case bonds aren't paying much, or interest rates go up and bonds go down and do even worse because bond values move in an opposite direction of interest rates. So if interest rates go up, bonds go down. But if interest rates stay low, well, they're not paying much. So I cannot underscore enough, and I've talked about it throughout 2019 on this program, a low interest rate environment is extremely dangerous for retirees. And the traditional investment planning that you that you that people typically do where they mix start mixing in more traditional US bonds, seventy thirty and then sixty forty, it's such a common plan. That type of a plan, in my opinion, is flat out not gonna work in the coming decade. It's just not because of the drag of traditional bonds. See, the reason people typically in the past have used tra- more traditional bonds is because they hedge stock market risk. So in the short term, when the stock market is going down dramatically, people are rushing to the safety of bonds and they help hedge that somewhat. So you don't lose as much. And in the short term, that is very important. The problem is, in order to do that, you're holding an asset that if I'm looking out in the long term, 10, 15 years, it's a losing proposition, in my opinion. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't own any traditional U.S. bond exposure. It means we've got to be very careful about how much we do own. And instead, to balance risk in our portfolio, we've got to look at other alternative vehicles, 
like non-traditional bonds. Non-traditional bonds are bonds that can go up with rising rates rather than down. And things like real estate and, and commodities and energy. Things that, you know, the idea of diversification is you have a whole bunch of stuff in your portfolio that if one thing zigs, another zags. That way, if one thing like stocks or stock funds, mutual funds is way down, hopefully they're not all the way down because you have all these other alternative things that maybe are holding their own or going up. So you've got more diversification. That traditional 60, 40, 70, 30 blend is really not very diversified when it comes to the stock market. It's pretty much betting on the stock market. And then in order to try to hedge risk in the short term, you're adding an asset class that's going to hurt you in the long term. So I think plans in the 2020s and moving forward need to be much more diversified and have much more alternative asset classes. And when you look at safe alternatives, you've got to look at other alternatives because fixed bonds and CDs are just not very attractive and probably won't be for a good while. So you need to look at other alternatives where you can make more money on your safe investments. And then you've got more balance and diversification on your risk investments. Now, the last thing I want to mention is when we talk about outlook for 2020 and then and then what does the next decade look is, what is your ultimate goal? What is it you want to accomplish with your money? Because too many people, a financial plan for most people is what investments do you pick? And a financial plan is so much more than that. It's looking at ultimately what is the outcome that you want to achieve with your money. Nobody knows the future of markets. How can you position your money to give you the greatest likelihood of meeting your goals? And there are a lot of components to that. Certainly how you pick investments is a very important part of that, which a big part is balancing risk and diversification and all that stuff. But then it's others. How do you structure income for retirement? How do you protect income? In the first five or six years of retirement, if we do have a bear market the next couple of years, how do you protect your retirement income? Your income plan. We don't retire on assets. We retire on income. It's how you take your assets and and, and convert those to to stable, increasing income that hopefully doesn't expire before you do. What about your tax planning? If it's going to be hard to get a robust return over the next 10 years in the stock market, if you can minimize your tax burden... That can have a huge impact. Tax planning is essential in today's world. What about health care planning? What about estate planning? It's all of the, what about social security election? The most important election you'll vote on in your retirement years. So a financial plan is putting all of these things together and not overlooking anything. Because uh, it's like a, a bunch of pieces of a puzzle and then they have to be coordinated and brought together. And the most common thing I see is, you know, you invest over here and then you go and do your estate planning in another spot and then you do your your tax accounting, which is really not tax planning. It's just tax preparation in the rearview mirror. But nobody's bringing all that stuff together in a comprehensive plan. And what's the outcome you're after? So it's not just do you pick a mutual fund or an ETF or a stock or an annuity or a bond or a CD. It's What is it you want to accomplish? And then the products are just vehicles to get you there. They're important, but you start with what it is you want to accomplish. I want to, I hope God blesses you in 2020 and in the coming decade. We're going to have more great shows, more great information to bring you to help the quality of your life. So stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Go to www.broganfinancial.com to follow us. Sign up for our weekly e-blast. I hope to meet you in 2020, maybe at one of our classes. And uh, God's prosperity for all of you listening this morning. God bless you as you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. By Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.